So I'm going to read um, one verse from the Bhagavad Gita from the fourth chapter entitled Transcendental Knowledge and also part of the purport by his divine grace Srila Prabhupada. Achopisan avyayatma bhutanam ishvaropisan prakritim svamadishtaya sambhavami atmamayaya. Although I am unborn and my transcendental body never deteriorates, and although I am the Lord of all living entities, I still appear in every millennium in my original transcendental form. Purport. The Lord has spoken about the peculiarity of his birth. Although he may appear like an ordinary person, he remembers everything of his many, many past births. Whereas a common man cannot remember that he has done even a few what he has done even a few hours before. If someone is asked what he did exactly at the same time one day earlier, it would be very difficult for a common man to answer immediately. He would surely have to dredge his memory to recall what he was doing exactly at the same time one day before. And yet, men often dare claim to be God or Krishna. One should not be misled by such meaningless claims. Then again, the Lord explains his prakriti or his form. Prakriti means nature as well as svarupa or one's own form. The Lord says that he appears in his own body. He does not change his body as the common living entity changes from one body to another. The conditioned soul may have one kind of body in the present birth, but he has a different body in the next birth. In the material world, the living entity has no fixed body from one body to another. The Lord, however, does not do so. Whenever he appears, he does so in the same original body by his internal potency. In other words, Krishna appears in this material world in his original eternal form, with two hands holding a flute. He appears exactly in his eternal body, uncontaminated by this material world. Although he appears in the same transcendental body and is Lord of the universe, it still appears that he takes his an ordinary ordinary living entity. And although his body does not deteriorate like a material body, it still appears that Lord Krishna grows from childhood to boyhood and from boyhood to youth. But astonishingly enough, he never ages beyond youth. At the time of the battle of Kurukshetra, he had many grandchildren at home, or in other words, he had sufficiently aged by material calculation. Still he looked just like a young man 20 or 25 years old. We never see a picture of Krishna in old age because he never grows old like us, although he is the oldest person in the whole creation, past, present and future. Neither his body nor his intelligence ever deteriorates or changes. Therefore, it is clear that in spite of his being in the material world, he is the same unborn eternal form of bliss and knowledge changeless in his transcendental body and intelligence. So we'll stop here. Oma Kyana Timirandasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshuram Militam Yena Tasmashi Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manobishtam Stapitam Yenabutale Swayam Rupa Garamayam Nadati Swabrantikam Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sari Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Vagisha Yasya Vadhane, Lakshmi Yasya Chavakshasi, Yasya Te Ridaye Samvit, Tam Narasim Ham Maham Bhaje, Paralada Ridayaladam, Bhakta Vitya Vidaram, Sharatindu Rajim Vande Vavindra Vandanam Harim. I'm going to read the verse once more. Krishna says, Although I am unborn and my transcendental body never deteriorates, and although I am the Lord of all living entities, I still appear in every millennium in my original transcendental form. What we attempt to do today, or what I attempt to do today, is a glorification of a particular appearance 
of the Lord. In this verse, he talks, or Krishna talks about that he has one particular essential identity, a form, a shape in which he is recognized as, in our terms, the supreme person hmm, or the supreme personality of Godhead. Um, at the same time, he has many other forms. The Vedic scriptures inform us that God is not limited in his appearances. He can accept so many forms as he also allows every living entity to accept all kinds of forms. The Bhagavad Gita informs us that there's a total of 8,400,000 species in this universe, with, of course, its according subspecies that can be then accordingly measured or calculated. And this is a creation of the Lord, and it allows the, the, the souls to um, adopt or like accept a variety of lives in different types of bodies. So at the same time, it says these forms, of course, essentially originate from the Supreme Lord or the cause, and therefore he can also, by his own will, choose any form he likes. But uh, there's a difference between that, this we will hear. Maybe up front, the Bhagavad Gita is translated called the Song of God, like where Krishna is instructing his dear friend and devotee Arjuna on a variety of spiritual topics. And there are main five main topics, and one is Ishvara, or what is the Lord in the Vedic understanding. Then there is the Jiva, that means the souls we are, you know, and how do we relate to him. And in this purport also the word Prakriti was used, which is translated as nature, or we would say material nature. Um, then there are two more subjects, time and also um, activity or karma. So these five constitute like the basic uh, topics of spiritual knowledge and are elaborated within the Bhagavad Gita. And the intention is that those who study those books or like who make an attempt to, uh, to understand it, that they get an understanding, create a consciousness of what is the Lord, what is my, whom I, what is the world, in a sense to answer basic philosophical questions which arise in the human form of life. So in here in this verse we are at a point where Krishna identifies um, what or how to understand, or like he identifies himself in a sense, but also explains how to understand his very nature or body. Essentially, the Vaishnava philosophy teaches us that there are two main energies, the spiritual and the material. So we leave the Sanskrit terms aside. Um, and both originate from the Supreme Lord, as said, Krishna or the Ishvara is the source of everything that exists. And he also controls those energies. Um, also within a given universe, we have a variety of opportunities of life. Mm, we just mentioned the 8,400,000 species. So the souls and the material energy are considered both originating from the Supreme Lord and both can accept forms, the Lord and the, and the living entities. The main difference is if the soul accepts a body made from matter, it becomes governed or ruled by material laws. We have to follow a certain, um, how to say, dictate, you know, simply with eating or sleeping. We cannot say, oh no, I do not eat, or whenever I eat, it's I choose to eat. No, I have to eat, <laughs> or I have to sleep at a certain point. Whereas when Krishna appears, he says in his own body, it is not to be understood that this is like a material body. It's free from the dictate of material nature. In fact, here the word is said, transcendental body. It means a spiritual body which has nothing actually to do with matter, but becomes visible within this world when Krishna or God chooses to make himself accessible to all the living entities within the universe. And this is something that is very much emphasized when you may start to read this literature, that this distinction between what is a material body and what is a spiritual body, who is Krishna in relation to the material nature and what are we in relationship to the material nature, 
this is important to be understood in order to not confuse um, God to be an ordinary living entity. This is essentially the, the aim. Why is there so much stress? So, so it is as we in, in Sanskrit, there's the word tattva to establish the truth or essential identity of something. Um, here he speaks also of like when he appears in this human form. It is explained in the in the shastras also the means the literature that we read that Krishna has an original form which uh, is like a human form like two arms two hands he plays flute you have him like here above you can see an image of that um, at the same time he uh, chooses also other forms and today we celebrate a form um, which is an animal um, Varaha Dev, Varaha means boar or like this um, wild pigs, you know. Um, and he also does that for a certain purpose. Um, he can assume those forms um, and without that they are f uh, limited or conditioned as a material form would be. You can imagine he has the blueprint or like the original um, image of, uh, of an animal. And he can appear, he makes his body change to become like that, to appear like that, without that he, um, he changes in his spiritual nature. Um, and before we enter the pastime um, of Arahadev, perhaps we can say a few words about the universe with all its living entities. Because when Krishna speaks here, he talks also about how he appears on this earth. Um, the message of the Bhagavad Gita is that Krishna is interested that everyone, all of us, reconnect with him because we are his parts and parcels. He said we originate from him. But we have the capacity to forget that and be in a disconnected state. So he reveals in different ways, also in different religions, he appear, uh, reveals certain uh, type of knowledge, a certain process of self-realization so that all living entities, particularly the humans, that they can attain God or self-realization. So in different cultures that might look a bit different, essentially we speak here of yoga or the reconnection um, with Krishna. You heard a lot of singing going on, a lot of mantra singing, which is our essential attempt to reconnect to Krishna by calling out his name or calling for him, um, which is essentially um, all we can do really <laughs> we can make other efforts um, in terms of work tapasya, difficult yoga practice but uh, another form of Krishna has revealed this process saying this is eligible to everyone so you might try other things as well but what is eligible for most of the people um, is the chanting or like the singing of Krishna's names in this way try to reconnect with Krishna. You will also hear in this pastime how Krishna is accessible through sound, or God is accessible through sound. And the Vedas also explain sound is that what gives an image of a given thing, or an idea of it, through sound actually. You see more than through eyes. We are very much accustomed to our eyes. Um, and maybe a short side note, in, in Zurich there is one restaurant, it's called Blinde Kuh, or Blind Cow. It's the the the, uh, the idea is like blind people work there, they serve their waiters or waitresses, and you as a guest you also enter the world of the blind, so there's no light in it. You sit in complete darkness, and then you have your meal. <laughs> it's only being served and led in by blind people, and you can enter a, a world without sight. And you will notice how you have to rely a lot on on your ears and how actually sound is a very um, or even maybe sometimes more informative of something than vision. So it's a process. Sometimes also yogis, they kind of um, make themselves little rooms or huts where they have as less as possible sensual input so that they can just focus on hearing transcendental sound in order to connect to higher consciousness. So on earth, um, Krishna appears in this human form, but he also exchanges with uh, all living entities all over the universe. 
So we hear from the scriptures that not only the planet Earth is inhabited by living entities, no, that actually everywhere there are living entities, even on the sun, just in different bodies. Yeah. Um, and the creation, according to the Vedic version, is done by Vishnu, a form of the Lord who manifests. Um, they're called little golden eggs when they first develop. And within this egg, he appears as another form. And by his transcendental perspiration, he just fills each universe half with water. So that's the Vedic version of how universe in its basic structure looks like. And we also get a number of how big it is. And this, it is approximately, it's not the exact number, four and a half billion kilometers. That's the diameter of the universe according to the Vedic version. And the Earth is like approximately 12,000 12, kilometers in diameter. So these are some measurements we can already have in mind. And it said there are like 14 planetary systems according to the um, Vedic scriptures. And all of them are being manifested by a person called Brahma. Brahma, um, maybe some of you know that, there is like a famous picture where Vishnu is a form that lays on a big snake on an ocean. And out of his navel comes a lotus flower. And on this lotus flower, on top sits a person with four heads. And this is Lord Brahma. It said he is the secondary creator within a universe and his task is to manifest planets and all the living entities. So Vishnu himself doesn't do it. Um, actually, Brahma is the empowered person to do so. And there's a whole time span of his life. If you're later interested, we can talk about that. We don't want to give too much numbers. Um, so, But also they said when he sleeps, Brahma, then partially the creation is being destroyed, like the water level rises, then he wakes up again, water level sinks. And the planets over and over again are newly manifested in an immense time span we can hardly access with our minds. So on each time when this happens, of course he needs to take care that for example also the earth is being populated. And he can he is empowered to manifest out of himself um, personalities that can serve in a function of um, in the Sanskrit it's called a Manu or also Prajapati. Manu means someone who is the father of mankind. So he, he manifests someone who is called um, Svayambhu Vamani. Brahma himself is called Svayambhu because he's not born from a male and female combination but he comes out of the lotus flower and he manifests Svayambhu Vamanu who comes from his own body. And this one was very eager to serve Brahma and say, okay, with his wife together, he also was presented or like provided with a wife, we will do that. We will populate the earth. There's just one problem. The earth is not there. <laughs> we heard before like the ocean is filled with half with water and it's like has a 4.5 billion kilometer diameter. And so the ocean is quite deep. And it happened somehow or other that the earth was falling or had felt into that ocean down to the ground. And Brahma was wondering what to do. And since he's naturally a great devotee of Vishnu or Krishna, he contemplated um, and meditated on Vishnu, thinking what to do now, how can this be solved? Because the earth is supposed to be populated. <laughs> So and then what happens while he was contemplating, um, out of his nostril came a little creature which resembled the form of a boar, a little pig in a reddish complexion. And then it circled and it made bigger circles and the, the bigger the circles got, also the bigger the, the form got. Like and it got amazingly huge. And everyone was wondering, what is that amazing form? Brahma was contemplating, then there were other great personalities around sages and thinking, who is that form? Is it Vishnu? Is it God You know, who appears? And then at some point, the form made a tumultuous sound, a roaring that was vibrating throughout the universe. It said a sublime sound came out of it. 
course, when we, when we think of boars or pigs and the sounds they make, we might not necessarily consider it a sublime <laughs> sound. It's like an, how do you say in English, grunzen? It's like kind of a grunzen, what do you say? The is it grunting? Uh, whatever, you know, the sounds <laughs> pigs make. But it was an, a sound like it's also explained like a mountain would make a sound. And you might wonder, yeah, what sound does a mountain make? <laughs> you know, particular Swiss people live in the mountains. Do you ever hear them making sounds? Oh, yeah, making a sound. <laughs> Um, Srila Prabhupada comments that um, this relates to size. We should get, a, get an idea of like the immensity of the sound. I just imagine that if a, if a mountain would crack, so to say, or move, it would be like the, sh the shaking and vibrating would be heard probably all over the planet so because of it's a massive body. And I said this roar of Arahadev also entered like the whole universe and confirmed, yes, it's me. Vishnu is there. So Brahma knew, the other personalities knew, oh yeah, that's the Lord who appeared. And the activities of Krishna or Vishnu, they are called Leela. Leela is a Sanskrit term for which is used as pastime. Pastimes means it's, it's a, the activity is playful and not under any kind of force or coercion. Like we said before, material nature forces each living entity to act according to its rules. But this is like completely free from it. Um, he's not forced to uh, accept a body of a boar. He chooses to. We say out of his sweet will. Because he likes to enjoy that form, it anyway originates within him. He had the idea in the first place that there could be a boar. <laughs> so he's also entitled <laughs> to use that form um, for his pastimes. And it said, while he did so, he, when, when Krishna acts like this, he enjoys himself. And you see, some of you have animals around, animals with tails, and you know they tend to slash their tails, particularly when they're happy, when they enjoy something, when they eat or when they see someone. And also pigs do that. Sometimes you can see when they, with their nose or with their kind of hooves, when they're like in the, in the mud and like and they make their sounds, they also their tail slashes. And I said also Rahadev was slashing his tail because he enjoyed what was going to happen, his own activities. And he made a second roar, a, tec a transcendental sound that again vibrated through all the planets. And the great sages recognized this is a sound not from this world. Um, and they reciprocated by chanting other Vedic mantras. You know, we chanted some mantras today already. There's a whole tradition of chanting different hymns and mantras from the Vedas in order to reciprocate with that sound. And Rahadev, with his, um, he made an before he entered the waters, he made a third sound, which confirmed the sages, so to speak, in their praise. So he reciprocated simply through sound, like to one powerful sound. Like first to Brahma, confirming, yes, it's me, Vishnu. Second, also to the sages, um, that they understand, yes, this is the personified Vedas, or like the, uh, the Supreme Lord. Um, also, as a side note, the Vedic, for some, it's uh, mythology. For us, it's like our tradition, our faith. Um, says the Vedas originate from the breath of the Supreme Person. And I said, Brahma, the one we heard about, he inhales that. And when he exhales and Varaha comes out of it, it's considered, oh yeah, he is the personified Veda, actually, the manifestation of transcendental knowledge. And it said his sound was pleasing to those who are inclined to him. You know, and they felt, wow, he's going to solve the problem <laughs> because the earth was missing. <laughs> just imagine the earth is missing, you know, we just feel like a person is missing, right? But imagine the whole planet would be just gone. I mean, we would be gone, but um, simply this is the task on a, on a bigger scale in the universe. So um, at the same time, his sound also gave a message to other types of people, <laughs> we would say, the so-called asuras or, or the demons who are opposed to God. And he said that his sound was also a challenge to do and because later in this past time we hear about a particular very powerful um, demo demonic being who was challenging him. Um, so these were 
the 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 ways how how, how Varahadev made himself known as the supreme lord who came to solve the problem um, so to speak um, and then he entered into the Garbhodaka ocean that's the name of the ocean which fills the universe to a half and it said he was since he is so immense just let's remember the um, the uh, the diameter also of the earth 12,000 something kilometers or miles so this is supposed to fit on the little um, tusks what is of the, of the, of the of the boar so just imagine how huge his body must have been and also it's described like as a mountain hard and intense so that he could perform this task and he entered to the ocean and split it in half and the ocean was afraid to die so you might also think an ocean who is as a person but the Vedas described like this everything is embodied even the ocean is a person and like if you say also mother earth also the earth itself has a personification according to the Vedic worldview and therefore we approach her as mother earth or then also the ocean accordingly so he was afraid that he would die because he was splashed all over but of course he did not die but it was an intense experience for him when Varahadev entered and as we said before, he adopts this body because he chooses to, but also he considered that's actually the best body for that task. We know pigs have one very powerful uh, ability. This, what is that? Smell. Yes, the famous truffle pigs, or they can just enter in the earth and they have a very distinct sense of smell. And it's also earth has so many aromas you know and he they find just wherever all these truffles so he also is said to not have looked for the earth but he smelt the earth like where it was somewhere on the bottom of this gigantic ocean and he entered and went as deep as it needed and then he brought up the earth on his tasks which are described as being glittering white very sublime very beautiful and i said when he came out because pigs, they have, um, forgive me, I don't know in English, Boston, their hairs are really kind of strong, like thick, you know. And he splashed water all over. And sin since it had, um, of course, touched his body, and he is transcendental ecstasy personified, God is in his body very um, blissful, the water that splashed to all the planetar planetary systems touched also the great sages, and they become became extremely ecstatic. We call it um, um, the, the Abhishek water. It's like a so-called Maha Prasadam, we say. It's like a great uh, mercy which can bring one in a, in a blissful state. So this was also something that happened. He splashed the um, bathing water all over his devotees and brought the earth um, on the surface and allowed it to float or like in space. So resting there so that was how he first of all solved that issue but then already a second issue <laughs> arrived so Vishnu is a big problem solver um, because at the same time there was a great personality called Hiran Yaksha um, and he and his brother particularly his brother managed to um, occupy the universe maybe a little funny comparison is like as the Americans tried now like some while ago to occupy the um, what's the place called the cap capital this this place so to take over so here in Yaksha in, indeed uh, here in Akashipu succeeded um, on a higher planetary system to take over so he was practically the boss <laughs> in the universe at that time and his brother was always very interested to please please his bigger twin brother um, and pleasing meant to terrorize everyone else. So that was <laughs> that was, was pleasing to, to Hiranyakashipu. Um, so he went through the universe and tried to find powerful people he could challenge. And powerful people doesn't mean on Earth, like some big uh, athletes or something. No, he went through what is called demigods and down in the ocean. There's also um, a personality called Varuna. As we said before, like the Vedas say, each planet and also the elements they have a personification like Bhumi is the mother earth and uh, for the waters there's Varuna a demigod who governs that element 
And he goes to him and in a sarcastic, humiliating way, bows down in front of him saying, please, noble one, give me a fight. And it was clear he was superior. It was clear he, there was no fight really for, um, for Varunadev. And he said practically, I'm too old, I'm retired. <laughs> that was his argument to not participate in the fight. <laughs> it's also a good one. I'm too old for that. I cannot fight anymore. And he said, but there is another personality that might be suiting um, to for you or like to you as an, as an opponent. And he directed him towards the, the place where uh, Varahadev was lifting the earth out of the, uh, of the ocean. And then when these two met, it was intense because uh, Yuran Yaksha was felt like, what is this amphibious beast? And he started to insult him and say, what do you do with my earth? Mm. That was also his mentality. <laughs> it's, it's ours, it's our universe. And it reflects also, even if it's this a story is something a bit more fantastic, but the essential thing is like that also we as conditioned souls, as we are called in the scriptures, have this mentality that we own things that are actually not ours, like also this planet. We have also um, privacy in terms of uh, um, private property. Uh, also in Switzerland, it's big. Like you have many little signs everywhere. That's private way. You cannot walk here. That's a private way. It's my little <laughs> way. I didn't create it. I just have a paper that says it's mine. <laughs> and I paid some with some other paper. I made sure like I get the other paper that says it's mine. So, um, but it's a big misconception. We don't own anything, but we claim it because that's the misconception. And the true owner is God because he's the creator. So also here on Yaksha made this claim and then challenged <coughs> this Varahadev for a fight. So I tried always this past time to imagine like, you know, the hooves of a uh, or something like this, but he could handle weapons in it. So very expertly. Um, also some paintings you can see, it's like portrait like this. And there's a certain, uh, I have the word for it, a certain way how things go when, when Vishnu or Krishna fights. At the beginning there are always weapons. Like they have uh, clubs, here in Yaksha had clubs, he had clubs, and they a club fight was starting. And the bows were very expert, you know, they could, one could dodge um, uh, the, 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 the blows of the other one. And then Varahadev managed to kick out with his other hoof the, the club out of Hiranyaksha's hand and then told him, come on, pick it up again. And Hiranyaksha was too proud saying, no, that's humiliating and took out another weapon in order to not have to pick up his club again. Also this weapon was destroyed and at the end they had to rely on fists. So that's often what happens when you hear those descriptions, then it gets closer. And you can also take this as a symbolism, also the fight with God or against God gradually leads to kind of closeness at the end. Um, they say also in German you have the saying, um, friction um, creates warmth. You know, you know that there's like, um, that even if you have like some kind of conflicts or you rub on each other, although you have like kind of maybe enmity, still it brings you in a sense closer to each other, you, you connect in a way. Um, I'm not saying you're supposed to <laughs> be <laughs> inimical towards Krishna. It's just saying this is also what happens. Um, that in this way, there's also a, a, a connection uh, to the Lord. And here in Yaksha was said to have great mystical, uh, mystic powers. He could create illusions. Illusions in a sense, he created an environment where like horrible things rain from the sky, like blood and pus and all kinds of uh, d dangerous creatures appeared. And such illusions have the power actually to kill someone. That is because you can also see the mind, if it has a strong idea, makes it true, even it, if, it, if it doesn't exist physically in front of you. You know, some people, like they could die from, from an hallucination, theoretically, because if the body is convinced, for example, there's no air, although there is air, you know, people die. So they could kind of manipulate a matter like this, but then also Vishnu could, of course, like um, counter it. And at the end, Hiranyaksha tried to take um, Varahadev in his kind of grip. And that was very, it's a very significant gesture. It didn't work because he suddenly sensed that Varahadev stands next to him. 
Um, and and Sri Prabhupada explains this also represents the attempt of like materialistic persons with a materialistic mindset to capture God with a limited intelligence or capacities and it will never work. Because that we try to capture there is so many times bigger than we are, so there's no point to try to accommodate something unlimited within a limited mind or power. To some degree we can, because otherwise if God would be completely non-understandable, we wouldn't need to bother trying to study him. Right, so, but there is partial capacity to understand God or Krishna and our relationship to him. And this is what the Vedic scriptures aim at, to make us understand you are a part of God and you have a relationship with him. And the idea is in your human life you are particularly blessed to reawaken this relationship. So in other forms of life it's not possible. They're not designed for that. You can't just be like, for example, a pig and enjoy whatever enjoyable things <laughs> come your way. But as a human being, you're capable to higher consciousness. And that's the big blessing of human life. And the scriptures urge us to recognize that opportunity and develop a sense of urgency to say, in this life, it's possible to develop oneself spiritually and therefore do it. Please do it before you have to give up this uh, human form again because you don't know what will be your next form. So it might be another human form, hopefully, if we have to come again. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then there we are capable. Mm. And at the end it said when, when Hiranyaksha tried all of it, um, Rahadev chose a very simple, some, uh, call it seems even kind of ridiculous how he killed him, which is like, I said he with his hooves, he tipped the root of his ear and then the demon started reeling It said the eyes popped off his sockles and just he died. That was how, how Hiranyaksha found his end. And then also what Varadev did is like he changed his color. He was reddish but then he turned slightly bluish and the significance is to show he's the supreme lord again to confirm that. You know, he has his original color also. Um, sometimes people ask, why is Krishna blue? Um, we can't answer that. We can just say, you might ask him at some point when you <laughs> meet him. It's just what the scriptures reveal. That's how he has been seen by great self-realized souls. Um, and the pastime of the earth falling into this ocean can also be seen as an analogy. Sometimes the material existence itself is considered to be like an ocean in which the souls fall in and they drown there and we are deep underwater kind of close to um, drowning and we need someone to pull us up actually and uh, Krishna is called Patita Pavana we have one form here on the altar on the outer right this is um, Jagannath Jagat means universe and Jagannatha is the Lord so he's also called Patita Pavana those who rescues or picks or uh, how to say uplifts the fallen souls so also s in a in a sense in a symbolic sense is also us we are in this ocean and we depend so to speak on the supreme lord's mercy to be pulled up again out of the water mm. because it said we are in an artificial environment material world and we actually would belong into the spiritual sky it's called the Vedas speak of Vaikuntha, you know, a work without fear. So that would be our actual destination and it said the, the, the task of human life, the Vedas say, also Krishna says, is to regain that original position. Hare Krishna. So these are some of my thoughts and explanations. So there we can open up for some comments and questions, if you wish. You're also su supposed to have a microphone. It's not working, right? I think, I think the battery is empty. Oh, cool. Thank you very much for the class. 
Um, can we compare the demigods or the sages you mentioned who reside on higher planetary systems? Can we can we compare them with aliens? Well, I mean, strictly speaking, if the term means uh, resident outside of the earthen sphere, yes. I don't know if alien in terms of what we think of it based on Hollywood is that uh, that might be another story. <laughs> but they are extraterrestrial beings, definitely according to the Vedic version. Because hmm? we say on each planet there is life, plus in different ways. Because the, the spirit soul is not dependent on any matter for existence, but can assume a variety of forms. Even within fire, like the sun, they say they have very fiery, subtle bodies, not like us based on water and earth and so on. Is there a way to recognize Krishna? Yes, there is. Um, we particularly got um, the method of what we call Sankirtan, the congregational chanting or singing of the names of Krishna, because each name also has meanings. They describe Krishna's form. Krishna himself means also the all attractive, but also um, that he's eternally a lightful person who is the origin of just everything that exists. And it's said by singing or glorifying his names and uh, remember his pastimes that one can receive also the blessings that one becomes more and more aware of Krishna. We study philosophy in order to understand how he works in this world, how to, you know, we had a bit of insight also how he is the creator. And there's like much more like amazing description and um, discourse on how Krishna in the material nature and us can be understood by, for example, analytical study, by types of meditation. But at the end it said we, re we rely on on revelation. That means we can, by all our activities, we can attract Krishna's attention, so to speak. They say, okay, I show him or her a bit more of me. You know, one essential thing, we say we practice bhakti yoga. Bhakti means devotional service. By giving to Krishna some of our energy, of our work, our efforts, um, we connect with him. And this is also the, the founder of this movement, Bhakti Nasiya Sri Prabhupada, founded this um, whole, yeah, this movement for the purpose that people have an opportunity um, to connect with the service of the Lord. Also, for example, on this very day, on the Sundays, you know, so many activities are going on. If you just see this altar there, people need to decorate that, right? Then there's a lot of food. People need to cook that. People need to go shopping. People need to clean. People need to do so many things or finance it and, and work on the house. So there's so many opportunities how one can also enter a very practical way to connect to God by, in, in German you have also Gottesdienst, you say, or like service to God. It means like whatever you do, you dedicate to the pleasure of the Lord. So and of course we also invite and encourage everyone to be part of, of, for example, what's going on today and wherever you would like to join with the helping hand, that would be an opportunity to perform um, Bhakti Yoga. Mm. For example, also our Lucas here, I think, and also Dhamma Prasad. There are people who are happy also to, if you're interested, to, to involve you a bit in the process, but also come chanting with us, like her, like here with us, and read our books. I mean, it's our books, like the books <laughs> translated by Shiva Prabhupada. Is that satisfying your question? Uh, the relationship between um, Brahma and um, Krishna and Rama, I would like to hear again. Between Brahma and Krishna mm -hmm. and Ram. I mean, particularly the connection between Brahma and Vishnu is described, for example, in the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. We hear that Brahma is being manifested from the, uh, the lotus flower that comes out of, this of, this of the navel of Gavuda Kashya Vishnu. And he can be of two types. He can be a soul like us, but he can al also be an expansion of Vishnu. So these possibilities are there. 
in the case that he is a living entity like us that has attained this position of Brahma, um, usually he is referred to as being in a relationship of a servant and also a friend. It is said like all the demigods are the empowered servants in the universe. They can govern planets, they can govern elements like Brahma. He can perform the whole secondary creation, which is amazing. Um, and in the second canto, it is described how Brahma attains this revelation we talked about after his tapasya. And there he enters Vaikuntha, the world where Vishnu or Narayan is present. And it is described how he met him there, they talked, and Narayan also blessed Brahma with being able to do the secondary creation, and they shook hands. Like, that was an interesting gesture, they shook hands. And Krishna said, I'm pleased with you. And Sri Prabhupada comments, this is an indication, or from this it becomes clear that Brahma and uh, Vishnu are in a relationship of friends, or friendship. So at the same time, he's an empowered servant. So this is what, for example, Srimad Bhagavatam tells us. There might be other, sometimes, comments on the um, identity of Brahma. This depends on the jiva, on the soul. Could also be that his um, relationship might differ according to the universe we talk about. Is that um, with Ram, I don't have a particular connection or to what it would be with Ram. All right. <laughs>